everyone, I'm Wei Chim, and I'm the author of The Surprising Power of a Good Dumpling. This is a contemporary young adult that came out last year with Alan and Anwin, and it's set in the inner west of Sydney, the suburb of Ashfield, and it's about 16-year-old Anna Chu. And she's, she's growing up, and she has, things are a bit tough for her right now. Um, she's the eldest child in an Chinese immigrant family, so she has quite a lot of responsibility and a lot on her plate. Um, her father is working really hard at his restaurant, which is all the way in Gosford, so he's not home very much, and he often chooses to spend a lot of time even spending nights at the restaurant. And as for Anna's mother, well, she has some... she starts off of the book a bit bedbound, and the reason for that is she has some sort of mental illness, and it keeps her from being able to take care of her family in the way that I think she would like to, but she suffers through long bouts where she has to stay in bed and she doesn't have the energy to get up and she's really sad and all of those things. So poor Anna is left with a lot of the role of being the primary caretaker. So she's looking after her younger sister and brother, making sure that they get to school and making sure that they're picked up from school and even cooking meals for them. And meanwhile, poor Anna, she just wants to be a teenager. She just wants to be a normal teenager. And she would love to focus on her studies, but academics can be a little bit hard for her. Her guidance counselor thinks that she's not applying herself and isn't liking her prospects of how she's going to tackle the HSSC next year. So Anna's got a lot on her plate. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about The Surprising Power of a Good Dumpling. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read a little bit of the first chapter so you can get a little bit of an understanding of what the book explores and the type of life that Anna is going through in her day-to-day. -day. So I will start with reading chapter one. Yeah, February. The shadows of the leaves on the wall bend to the right, like gentle waves coming to shore. It could be a good day. When Ma stays in bed, our mornings are a game of fortune-telling, where I'm forever looking for signs. The search begins when I try to coax her up with a cup of herbal tea. I shuffle down the hallway, looking for a shadow that looks like a smiley face, waiting for a shock from the doorknob, or trying to miss the creaking board on the floor. These signs tell me something about what to expect behind Ma's closed door. I can't say if they work or not. There was definitely a day I missed the squeaking board and Ma ended up throwing the tea I brought her against the wall. Bad day. And then there was the time I thought the shadows outside Ma's bedroom door looked a little bit like a kitten playing with a balloon. That day, Ma went out and bought me and Lily new iPhones because she said they were on special. Good day. Today's shadows look promising and the knob doesn't shock me. The ceramic lid of Ma's special teacup rattles in my trembling hands as I push the door open. In here, the shadows look menacing. The thin slats of sunlight threaten to break through the barrier of darkness that engulfs the room. She's still in bed. Bad sign. One for one. I set the cup down on the bedside table. Ma's tiny form is lost in a swath of thick duna, so only a matted black nest of her hair pokes out. I know she's not sleeping. My heart sinks. She's been in bed for two weeks now. It's not the first time, and I know it won't be the last but I still can't smother the plumes of disappointment when she gets like this, when she stops being our mother. Out of habit, I push my glasses up against the bridge of my nose. Ma, ta, ti. I can still detect a tinge of hopefulness in my voice. She doesn't stir. A small breeze makes the blinds tremble and the beams of light shiver, but nothing else in the room moves, certainly not my mother. Ma, I put a hand on the cushion part that I think is her shoulder and shake gently. Only then does she move, and that's only to flinch my hand away. I stay by the side of the bed, waiting for another sign, some acknowledgement that I'm here, but she doesn't turn. As I leave, I shut the door as quietly as, as I can. This time, I think that maybe the waves in the shadows look more like spikes on a lizard, so not the good sign I thought they were. Or maybe they're just bloody leaves. I plaster on a smile and head into the kitchen. It's eerily quiet, just the sound of the dripping tap from the sink. It's the only plus side to Ma being in her room. My little brother and sister have been on their best behavior in the morning since Ma's been in bed. The two of them are crammed together on one side of the tiny dining room table making breakfast. 
Ma throws out through Ma threw out the toaster a while back. Toast is too yeet, hey, hot air. And the darkened bits cause sore throats, she says. So we are eating butter and jam on plain bread. Lily is helping to spread the jam for our five-year-old brother. Michael flattens his slice of white bread into a gooey patty and crams it into his mouth, jam and butter smearing all over his pudgy cheeks. I grab a paper towel to wipe it off, but it just spreads the sticky mess around. Now bits of paper towel cling to his face. I shrug and reach for the tub of butter. How's Ma? Lily asks. Sleeping, I say. Lily will know this is a lie, which makes it easier for me to say. I'm a terrible liar and I don't like to argue with my sister. While some people argue to be right, Lily argues just to prove the other person wrong. Mommy's sleeping. Shh, don't wake her up. Michael says this way too loudly, so I shush him. As expected, Lily is not buying. Okay, so like talking to herself or not talking at all? At 13, my little sister is more matter of fact and sarcastic than I've ever been. She's sleeping, I say again, and jam the butter knife into the hardened brick. I gouge out a piece, not caring that it looks like somebody has hacked away a piece of flesh from the middle of the block. I do my best to spread it, then give up and just fold the bread over. I eat my buttered bread in two big bites. The lump of butter melts slowly on the roof of my mouth. If mommy's sleeping again, are you taking me to school, Jette? Michael asks me, a snarl of paper towel still stuck to the corner of his mouth. His bowl haircut and perfect bangs make his brown eyes look even bigger. He's so cute, sometimes it hurts my heart. Lily is gonna have to take you today. Lily's outraged. I have to meet with my CT partners before a presentation. You can drop him off on your way. CT stands for Communications Theater. Calling it drama is too pedestrian for those students at Montgomery High. You start at nine, Lily. If you get going soon, you won't be late, I say. Ugh! Lily is complaining it's overly dramatic, but it doesn't faze me. She is up and running to our room, her sticky plate still on the table. I sign, pick up my hardly used plate along with hers. I leave the dishes in the sink and wet another paper towel in a final attempt to clean my brother's face. He sits there and lets me scrape things off with my chewed down to the nub nails. Baba didn't come home last night, my brother frowns. I know. Things must have been busy at the restaurant, I say. I've noticed this has been happening whenever Ma stays in bed, but I keep this to myself. Michael reaches up to touch my face. Look, Anna, an eyelash. You have to make a wish. I smile and comply, closing my eyes and blowing on his fingertip, wishing for Ma to be out of bed, for Baba to come home, for things to just be normal. We smile at each other as the eyelash disappears and Michael looks very pleased with himself. Okay, it's already past eight. Time to get ready for school, I tell him. But I need Mummy or Baba to sign my permission form. He waves a piece of paper under my nose. Our librarian, Miss Holloway, is taking us to an art camp, but she says I have to get my parents to sign it or I'll miss out. Can't we just make mommy up? I remember Ma's shape in the bed, all bundled up and still. The last thing I want is for Michael to see her that way. Tell you what, you go get ready and I'll see if I can wake her up, I say. His whole face brightens and the ache in my chest is gone in an instant. Are we going yet? Lily emerges from our bedroom, already dressed. She has pulled her hair back in a messy ponytail. Her real thin body is almost comical with her oversized backpack hanging extra low and bouncing against her bottom. A water bottle dangles from a carabiner clipped to the side. Hurry up, squirt. We have to go, she calls after Michael's retreating form. She plonks herself down, backpack and all, onto one of our metal folding chairs. The water bottle makes a loud thud as it hits the chair, which she doesn't notice, just crosses her arm and stares at me. She's not going to sign the form, you know. Know-it-all arch of her eyebrows, so perfect, I wonder if she's practiced it before. I know. I snatch a pen from the kitchen drawer and scroll on the line on the form. It's not the first time I've forged Ma's signature, and I'm sure Lily's done it a million times too. But we have an unspoken agreement between us. We protect Michael from Ma's tendencies, the, the bad ones at least, while we can. Lily lets out a not-so-subtle huff behind me. You know, if I get another lecture from Lucy, I'm going to tell her it's my sister's fault. I'm not taking the fall. Sure, whatever, and don't call your teachers by their first name. I place the butter in a used Ziploc bag and put it back in the freezer, where Ma insists on keeping it. The bread bag I tie up tightly, then knot it up in another plastic bag and stick it in the freezer. Everything in our house is tied up in plastic bags of some kind. All our food containers, cleaning supplies, even the picture frames on the shelves are sealed in clear plastic. Ma hates dust, but she doesn't like dusting, so every few weeks she just rips the plastic bags because they're cheap. Any eco-warrior would be terrified stepping into our house, but no one ever comes over, so there's no worry. Lucy tells us to call her that, Lily retorts. 
She says that children are human beings and deserve to be treated with the same respect as adults, so I can express myself to my full potential. I try not to roll my eyes. Thanks to his scholarship, Lily attends a rich private school just outside of Glebe. With a natural penchant for melodrama, Lily's sounding more and more like her well-off peers. I just hope they don't rub off too much. Dada, I can't find my other sock, Michael calls out to me from his bedroom. Do you want me to help you? No! Michael is going through a phase of being very particular about his privacy, especially with his sisters. He won't let us in when he's dressing or bathing, and will only let Mummy see him naked, which is making things harder for me and Lily as Ma's good moods are getting fewer and fewer. I miss the little guy who runs around naked with his half-done-up nappy trailing behind him. Lily rolls her eyes again. Oh gosh, I'm never going to get to school. Be quiet, I call through the closed door. Michael, you have five seconds to come out of there, or I'm coming in. No! The door bangs open and Michael is standing there in his school shirt and trousers, a striped sports sock on one foot and a gray knee-high sock on the other. I walk into his bedroom and get on my hands and knees to look. I snatch out what I hope is a gray sock, but it turns out to just be a giant dust bunny under the bed. Yuck. If Ma saw this, she'd lose it. Anna, I need my socks, Michael stamps his feet. Anna, I have to go! Lily's screeching makes me wince. Sorry, squirt, no time. I beckon him over and fold the knee-high sock over a few times to try and even the two out. I help Michael into his shoes and then put on his backpack. It's almost as big as Lily's, and he bends backwards slightly from the weight. And good news! Ma signed your slip, I wave it in front of him. He frowns says he takes it from me. Really? But you said she was asleep. Uh, she was, but she woke up for a bit and then went straight back to bed. I think she's really tired. My lying is pathetic and isn't fooling anyone, not even a five-year-old. But there's no time to argue. I grab my own school bag, an over-the-shoulder messenger bag that I bought with the money I saved from the one and only paid babysitting gig I ever had, before Ma forbade me to babysit at strangers' houses. How do I know their house is safe? They could do drugs or sell the guns. The woman paying me to babysit worked at the Woolies down the road and was hoping to pick up an extra shift on the public holiday. But there was no use pointing this out to Ma. Although these days, it doesn't seem to matter. She's so often in bed. As I leave for school, I pause by Ma's door, but don't go in. The shadows are gone now. At least for today, there are no more signs to consider. And that is chapter one of The Surprising Power of a Good Dumpling. I hope you did enjoy that. And if you can please find this book in your local bookstore or library, and you can find out more of what happens. Thanks so much for joining me, and have a great day.